Like many healthcare entrepreneurs, Daniel Kivitinos was a tech guy whose bad personal experience with the healthcare system led him to try to make things better. The founding of Dr. Chrono a decade ago coincided with the birth of the iPad and the iPhone, and the company has been closely linked to Apple hardware ever since. In fact, Daniel is such a hardcore Apple guy that he recommends buying two Apple Watches so you can wear one while the other is charging. In this edition of the Health Biz Podcast, Daniel charts the history of Dr. Chrono and shares what's coming next with the Apple Watch, artificial intelligence, and more. I'm your host, David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group. Thanks for tuning in. Daniel, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Yeah, it's great to be on. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So, so I know who you are, but not everybody does. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your, uh, your personal and career background? Sure. I'm originally a computer scientist and I have a psychology degree. So I have an interesting, unique skill set that comes together. But what I did with that is um, me and my co-founder actually started a company called Dr. Chrono. And Dr. Chrono, uh, the whole premise was around healthcare. And we had uh, experienced, I would say, unique and interesting problems with our family members. And we both got together from the lens of like uh, software developers. And we wanted to really try to figure out how do we, how do we make a difference and an impact in healthcare and company is about 10 years old. Uh, So I am the chief operating officer and co-founder of a company called Dr. Chrono. So Daniel, you know, there's probably I don't even know how many people there are that that started uh, healthcare companies because of personal experiences with with their family. You know, because the healthcare system is so screwed up, pretty much everybody has an impetus, you know, to to start something because they just can't believe how how bad it is. Usually, it takes them a little bit longer to solve the problem than what they were they were hoping for. So you're a decade into it, so you're uh, you're in the first stage uh, still, but. Uh, but that's uh, that sounds good. Now, one thing that uh, that happened around the time that you were starting uh, the company is Apple was kind of in a you know sort of in a resilient uh, mode and introducing some new products. iPad, iPhone came around uh, about that time. And thinking about the iPad in particular, which I think was the first device that Dr. Crona was was really on. You know, what has been the impact of the iPad uh, on healthcare and, and more broadly, it's, it's not a it's not a product we think about so much these days. But, but take us back to the you know how you think about that that product in particular. I remember I had a BlackBerry back in the day, and I had a uh, just a PC. And the way that people interact with computers was very uh, fixed. There was no way to dynamically change everything on like the whole product. And everybody just kind of accepted that. And the mouse was there and they had the mouse as like this visual aid for like moving things around or they had like a Blackberry keyboard or like a, you know, Nokia (laughs) hard keyboard. And the thing about the hard keyboard that was not helping us all as like human beings in the world. It took up a lot of real estate and it didn't change. So you would have half this phone or half the computer literally just be a hard fixed input device to get information in. And when the iPhone first came out, we, we started our company around that time and the iPhone, the first thought I had was this thing might be useful for healthcare. There might be something here. And what really resonated with me with, with the iPhone in particular was that it had a amazing web browser and it didn't have that restrictive keyboard. So you could take all of the real estate and change it the way that you want. So when when you think about the iPhone, it it really changed the game with that experience for, for, for everyone. So not just providers in the world, it was just everyone instantaneously. So 
2009, 2010, around that time period, Apple announced something called the iSlate or iPad that was coming out, this device. And me and my co-founder, we were just two, you know, we were just two guys wanting to like honestly work in healthcare. We were focusing on the cloud. It sounds so silly now. It sounds like ridiculous, but the cloud was not a thing back then. We're like, let's put all the data in the cloud. People didn't do that back then. It was a, it was kind of a newer thing. Email was, I think, moving at a faster pace than everything else. But healthcare, really, the cloud was not really a thing. It was becoming a thing, but it wasn't really a thing. Um, so we were building this software operating system for a medical practice. That was like kind of the premise of the of the company is we want to become the operating system for a medical practice to do everything they need to do to see patients, get paid, order prescriptions. But the but we we were building it all on the on the web. And we heard about the iPad and I don't think anyone really understood what the iPad was when it first came out. I think what what me and my co-founder understood was that it was a complete screen removing the keyboard and you have this device that can you can consume data at a very fast rate and move around with it unlike ever before so we were we were looking at it saying a physician what do they do all day they're moving around going from room to room, seeing patient to patient, if we can figure out a way to have them interact with this device and get data in as fast as possible and get data out as fast as possible, there's been nothing like it. There were some older like PCs. Yeah, there was a tablet, like the motion computing. They had one. Yeah, there were there were a few slates out there before, but it really it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. And 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 I, I saw how providers were struggling with that because they were really just like trying to hone in on like a button that really wasn't meant to be tapped. It was meant to be clicked. And that's another another like mental shift that I think the world had to make was tap versus clicks. Yeah. As silly as it sounds, so like when you were working on those older devices, it was a it was a click device. It was meant for a mouse. It was meant for a physical keyboard to be attached. But like they were kind of like hodgepodging it in a way that like, yes, this is a tablet now. Just deal with it the way that it is. But you probably need a keyboard and you probably you probably need a mouse. But have fun and try. Yeah. You know, it, it was interesting because around that time, you, you know, um, you know, physicians were kind of have computers imposed on them in, in a sense. And some people think that, you know, doctors are not into technology. Actually, they are, but they're not into lousy technology from administrators. And you still see when you go to the hospital, you have these, you know, computer on wheels, the cows. And around this time, I think, is when you started to see this phenomenon of, uh, you know, BYOD, bring your own device. So a physician would, would get an iPad themselves. It could fit into the, the small ones. The mini could fit into their lab coat pocket. They had the iPhone and they'd start to, to bring it in and CIOs kind of had to deal with it. And I think what you picked up on at that time uh, with Dr. Corona was that you know, people were in their regular life were experiencing something that was easy to use. They were learning, you know, they learned how to tap. They learned how to expand the screen with their fingers and so on. And then when they go to the to the uh, to the office, you know, they don't have that. So I think you kind of picked up on it at the same time. The physicians were kind of intuitively expecting it and, you know, seeing it in other parts of their life. Yeah, yeah, I I completely agree with that, and uh, I think this was Steve Jobs who had said this. He said, uh, "A stylus is one tap, a stylus," and that's what we were talking about with like the older devices. But you have ten fingers, so you can interact in a way with a newer device like an iPad with those ten fingers and have an experience unlike ever before. Like if I take Today, if you look at the iPad itself, Apple has so many unique gestures on like how you can move, navigate the device, and they're always thinking about that. That it allows you to essentially create a mouse with like two fingers on the keyboard. You know, you can take five fingers and swipe in, and it literally will move away away every app, and then you have your home screen. You can side swipe with four fingers. 
they've created Siri. I mean, but even I guess reversing a little bit and backstepping like back to that time when we started the company and the iPad came out, I think the device launched and the healthcare industry tends to move at a really slow pace. So everyone was super hesitant in healthcare. And a lot of people were not cloud-based in healthcare. Dr. Chrono was a cloud-based thing. We had API, that's an application programming language, which can interface with the iPad. You know who else was doing this? Netflix and Pandora. There were zero other electronic health records on the iPad when we launched. People were not sure what the device meant. We launched on day one of the iPad when it was like released to the public. And we do a lot of, I'd call it micro tests out there. Like, is this something that could work? We would work on the weekends, me and my co-founder, and we would hack together the iPad software before the actual hardware came out. We had our app ready. On the day of launch of the iPad, thousands of doctors started to flood in to ask for our product. And immediately I understood that doctors don't want to be restricted in the location that they're at with the computer on wheels. And you're going to need to use the cloud to pull data into a big screen. And the provider can do a lot of work very fast. And the challenge for Dr. Chrono as the device was released was how do we allow them to put as much data in? And how do we allow them to consume as much data about a patient as fast as possible? So we were really competing. Can you get as little taps to get the information as fast as possible in the provider's view? And we were really navigating the iPad. Honestly, before anyone else in the medical space was and trying to understand how do you capture this real estate? How do you utilize that real estate? But Inherently, I think providers in mass were pushing the iPad into the medical industry. They were buying it for their for their own personal use, bringing it into the medical practice that they were at, and saying, "I want to use this device," and and that pushed the iPad into the medical industry. So I think. You know, the purchase of the iPads and all of these, we've gotten thousands of users speaks volumes and like where, what is the direction and where does a provider want to go with the device? Yeah, no, so I mean, there's obviously been more devices since then and there've been different devices and frameworks that you've you looked at over time. We caught up back in 2014 uh, on an interview and there were a couple new things right then. Apple had this new uh, health kit. Uh, and also I think you were working uh, with Google Glass which people may may remember. What uh, what, what was the story with that? How did it go with HealthKit? Is that still part of the part of the package? And uh, where where's Google Glass? I see you're not wearing any of those today. Yeah. So think of the iPhone as a device that connects all of your health devices. Like, say you have a sleep apnea machine, you have a blood pressure cuff, you have a scale, you may have a glucose meter. You may have a, you know, internet connected thermometer. All of these things, because of HealthKit, allow you to bring that into your phone and view that medical information to track your health over time. It's honestly part of our future. And I think that it is a huge success. And I think people are using it in mass. And and there's always more to, to do and there's always more to adopt there. But the answer is... It is part of Dr. Corona's future. And the question is, because of coronavirus, because that has happened to us all, um, it kind of health, it actually pushes health kit forward, the coronavirus. And the reason why it pushes uh, healthcare forward, uh, the medical industry is embracing telehealth, telehealth, telemedicine, why Why is that happening? Doctors are getting the coronavirus. They can't see patients in person. Patients are getting coronavirus. They can't see the doctors in person. Convenience. 
maybe you have kids, maybe you have a homebound and an elderly person, but the government, Medicare in particular, think of them as the leader in the space. Medicare is kind of the revolution is revolutionizing everything, saying we're going to pay for these telehealth appointments. And when, when someone is paying for those telehealth appointments, that allows the provider to see more patients in mass. Now, what's interesting about health and health kit, bringing it back to that, all those, all those things you're like pulling in can be shared with a physician, right? So it, Dr. Crono being the operating system and the platform for, for physicians, we want to ingest that data so the provider can do what people are calling RPM, which is remote patient monitoring. Remote patient monitoring will allow our provider to do a more comprehensive telehealth visit. And health is part of that. So so Google Glass. Yeah. So companies are either, um, they're either growing or they're dying. And what I mean by that is you either have to be innovating or you're becoming stagnant over time. So with Google Glass, I think uh, we put these micro tests out that I had mentioned we put a test out there around Google Glass, and I think it's a concept that um, is part of our future. And I think, you know, Google put their effort out there. It's a noble effort. What we were envisioning was the provider was able to document a whole encounter and view information in real time with the patient in the room. So say uh, you're you're seeing a patient, maybe you want something to slide in on, on your side view that says this patient has, um, you know, is allergic to penicillin. Maybe you want actually a photo of the patient. So you're never treating the wrong patient. You know what patient you're supposed to see, you know that that patient is that patient. Um, so having that kind of overlay can really help a physician quite a bit. Uh, there's also real time, like, uh, say the physician can't be there and you have like a physician's assistant or you have a nurse and they're seeing the patient. You could also stream that information and say, Hey nurse, can you walk behind the patient to see how their back, you know, how their back is. So I think there's a lot of concept there that is really, um, it, it's going to happen. It's a matter of when and who's going to do it. And I wear glasses. I'm wearing my glasses right now. I personally would love to have information on my glasses if if the technology was there. Now, is the technology there? The answer is if there's more investment, maybe. But I would say the idea is right, and it's a matter of fun. Like, I'm wearing, you know, AirPods. Yeah, those work. If I spoke about that, I don't know, 20 years ago, people would think I'm crazy. We're going to take these two little pieces of plastic, (laughs) white pieces of plastic, and I'm just going to put them in my ears with no cord. You would think I'm insane. (laughs) Yeah. If I started to talk about that and and you. (laughs) No, exactly. So what about, so the other thing that was coming out around the time that we last connected was the, uh, the watch. And now we're up to, you know, number six. And the, I guess the cynical part of me says, well, it's just, you know, smaller screen, shorter battery life, no camera, not all that useful. Is the watch useful? If so, how? Uh, I would say a hundred percent. Yes. And one, I'll just give you one case where, where people might feel really comfortable with it. It has fall detection yep. and, it, and it has SOS. So God forbid you're in a car accident and your car is in a position where you can't open your door. You can SOS and try to get help. If you fall, it has fall detection. Now, is the device useful? 100% yes. And I think it's something that um, I'm wearing an Apple Watch right now. (coughs) There's two. Oh, okay. You have an Apple Watch on also. There's two parts to it. It's about accountability and health. Yeah. And then the other is around wellness and like uh, personal accountability. Uh, Because you're you're wearing an Apple Watch, I think you're a believer (laughs) And I think it's doing something for well, you. It's, it's, bo- it's boring if we both think it's great and we'll just say, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Next topic. So yes, but I want to hear why you think it's great. And I want to know whether I should get the the six so I can see my oxygen saturation without having to put something on my finger. 
I think uh, I think Apple Watch is here to stay, and I think it's only going to get better. And and I think it's only going to be more of a asset for people's health and accountability. Now, what what's silly is you know people will go to a they'll get a, like a workout coach. You know, how much is a workout coach? Sixty dollars an hour, hundred dollars an hour, fifty dollars an hour. Yeah, you have to drive to. <laughs> the gym, you have to get that coach to sit, you know, work with you. You have to find the time with that coach. I think Apple watch kind of flips things on, on its head and says, we're going to put the coach on your wrist and we're going to remind you to stand up every hour. And we're going to remind you to go for a walk. And we're going to suggest you take a minute to breathe. You're getting a lot of these things all in a small device. And there's a huge benefit. I haven't really looked at the reports, but I'm sure there's reports on how Apple's Apple Watch is helping like people at whole and, and in mass. But I think that the device is it is uh, unique and you know, we coined the term wearable health record at Dr. Chrono. So a wearable health record, a patient and a provider can uh, interact around a prescription on their wrist. So the provider can say, I want a uh, you know, to refill a prescription. That's the sort of thing that's super interesting because providers, their hands are always being used. Having them be able to look at their wrists for some information around the patient is a huge asset. So, you know, Apple has, uh, one. I think one of the themes here is a lot of the Apple devices are pretty good and Google and maybe Amazon struggle with some of their devices. There is kind of an interesting new uh, device from Amazon, this uh, Halo, which is different watch because it doesn't even have a screen on it. Um, how do you think about that? I think, uh, you know, with Apple Watch, they're always uh, trying to figure out how to optimize battery life. You know, just going back to Apple Watch a second, there is a unique uh, feature. If you have two Apple Watches, you can rotate. Do you have two Apple Watches or? I, ha- well, I have my wife's. She, she would maybe not notice if I take it, but uh, I only have one. Got it. If you have two Apple Watches, you can actually rotate and keep an Apple Watch on 24 hours a day. Now, why would you do that? to track your sleep. Yeah. But the great thing about an Apple watch is the screen, but the downfall of the Apple watch is the screen. Yeah. With, um, I think their objectives are similar. I think one being Amazon, they're really focusing on convenience of not having to take the device off. Yeah. Now, does does it bother a person that their Apple Watch is going to die? The answer is yes. Say you're traveling. You know, you might be traveling, um, I don't know, on a flight and it's a 24-hour flight. Where do you charge your Apple Watch? With what Amazon has created, you don't have that problem. That problem goes away. It is the same take in a different way to optimize battery, but also it is a different look and feel, right? It, it's almost like, it's almost like a wristband. I could have both though, right? So I think cause the, uh, the halo is going to check on my tone of voice and my mood and all that as well. So uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get, instead of getting two Apple watches, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll split it and I'll have one, one hand with, a, with Apple and one with Amazon and keep everybody happy. And I'll wear a Facebook helmet or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. So what about, you know, what's happening now is that there's also just a ton of data that's being generated. I mean, it's one thing for a physician to more easily uh, go through information on an iPad. It's another thing for that same physician uh, to be asked to now look at all the kind of wellness data from a, from a patient that's generated by uh, their watch or their wristband, or now that I'm going to get the two devices, you know, just this huge stream of information. Historically, I think uh, physicians haven't necessarily wanted it because maybe they have to go look at it and they'll maybe see, well, gee, there was this guy had a uh, an arrhythmia, you know, in the middle of the night a few weeks ago and now I didn't do anything about it. So, I mean, are we going to be able to use all this data? Did the doctors want it? Yeah, actually, just going back, you, you, you so you're definitely going to get the um, the Amazon wristband. Yeah, I put, but you have to be invited. And I think maybe I said something. I said something mean about them in a blog post, and they they're going to put me down on the list. I'm I'm on the list. I want one. Yeah. So that says something right there. It's how do you not compete? 
and right. create uh, a complementary device that's going to not compete. So that's actually really interesting. But they're also collecting data in a different way, right? So the, the audio, like you suggested, I do think that there is a challenge around data and data collection and how that data is presented. When you are overwhelmed as as a human being, you can only process so much data and there's so much stuff happening in our day. You have hundreds of decisions happening. You have uh, so much data thrown at you. You have all this like marketing and these ads thrown at you. You have so many people you're interacting with. How do you present the most relevant data to a person when they need it? And I think that's a challenge in healthcare where if you take someone's medical record and their medical billing data and all of this data and you put it in front of a physician and it's piles of piles, you know, just information overload. How is the physician going to know what is most important? Now, in the past, you used to just take that big binder and you'd kind of just pass it to the provider and the provider would have to like furiously look through it before they see the patient. Did they catch everything? The answer is no. And it's not their fault. It's just there's a lot of information that's captured around patients and, and providers have to sift through that. And, and frankly, you know, you as an individual taking care of your own health has to like sift through that. So it's a challenge for us all to figure out what the most relevant data is and how to present that. So I think that's something that, you know, at Dr. Crono that, that we're thinking about quite a bit. There's a lot of great data. It's all good. And it's actually all useful. But you want to present the most relevant data to the person at the point that they're looking at that data. And that's a huge challenge. But it's also a challenge that might, if we get it right, it'll be a really interesting time. Uh, meaning like if I have a someone's parents and the parents are saying they're 90s and you have their full medic record, you care about your parents, all of that data is valuable and you want to present that to the provider and you want them to be taken care of. The provider wants to do their job. They want to do the best job they can. But how do you realistically look at like the last time they had a surgery? Like maybe that was like 40 years ago, right? Like, and, and was that surgery relevant? It might've been really relevant. Like they may have had like something like open heart surgery and something might have happened and it's good to know that. Yeah. But I think that data is, is really valuable and it is, it is an exciting time where we can do something with that data. And I think it's, there's a lot of smart people looking at it saying like, how do we bring that data? How do we bubble the right data up at the right time? And, you know, that's where ML, machine learning and AI are all kind of coming into this equation. And I think we're learning a lot about like, how do we utilize that data? And there's always these wow moments with these types of devices where like Alexa is learning and Google is learning and Apple is learning to bring a lot of this data like to the forefront. And Dr. Crono is trying to do that in like the healthcare space specifically for the provider. So some of it is being used sort of behind the scenes uh, in order to present the data better to the physician. Uh, for you know, for decision making, I think you've got something else called Nimbler, which I think it's it's pronounced that way. It's kind of like Tumblr, I guess. It also left off the last e there before the R, um, and it's for the it's for the patient. I mean, when I see something like that, it looked very promising in a way. But on the other hand, I know like when I try to call up the customer service or something like that, or I'm on the computer with a, with a bot, you know, my first thought is just like get away from me. I don't like this thing. It's a it's it's annoying. So are we there yet uh, as it relates to Nimbler specifically? So Nimbler um, is a, a partner of Dr. Chronos. And what Nimbler is, is an app that you can connect into Dr. Chrono, our platform. And we're booking, I don't know, 400,000 appointments per week. Easy. How many of those appointments are canceled? Let's assume, I don't know, 20%. Yeah. Because the patient can't come in. Providers' time is valuable and they have to hire a staff member and the staff member has to literally like find out if they can fill that appointment. Now, a Nimbler, if a patient needs an appointment right away, can instantly start to chat with uh, AI. The patient can start to chat with AI. And 
it's not really a hard problem to find an open appointment slot. Yeah. What Nimbler is trying to do is say, hey, when would you like to come in? The patient says, uh, and immediately. If Nimbler in Dr. Chrono sees a uh, open appointment slot from a canceled appointment, it will just grab that slot for that patient and say, we'll, we'll bring you in at 2 p.m. today. So you're saving the staff member's time. You're saving the physician's time by booking the appointment. There is no downside to using something like a Nimbler. And I think that we are there with those those sort of chatbots. It depends on the issue. Yeah. When it comes to scheduling, it's a simple thing that people just want to book their appointment. And if you can do that through a text, it, it makes everyone's lives easier. And I think a Nimbler is a great example of like a real use case of AI working super productively in industry. So I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan. Now there's other type of AI that I'm sure you, you're, what you're bringing up, you know, if, if you've got uh, something more complex, AI might just kind of freeze up and just get a person on the phone for you. Uh, Nimbler looked good to me, but we'll, we'll we'll see. Maybe I'll have a chance to try it. So, Daniel, we started off this interview with kind of the, the personal side of things, and we'll end it in a, in a similar uh, fashion. Uh, assuming that you have time to read a book or or books, any any books you've been reading, anything that you uh, that you recommend or that you recommend that people avoid, which could also be helpful. There's a book from uh, Clay uh, Clay Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. Yeah, you may or may may or may not heard of it. I think that one had a huge impact in my life where it really like for larger companies as, as, as a company scales, it becomes harder to innovate because they're so happy with the revenue that they're getting. And when you look at the companies that are successful today, that keep reinventing themselves, they really invest in like future product, which is kind of counterintuitive to like existing product. Like if you look at the Kindle, Mm -hmm. you look at Amazon and they were selling books online, physical books, making all this money from that. And then they're like, we're going to compete with ourselves launching this crazy device. We're going to spend all this money on this device. They were eating their own revenue stream (laughs) with a new device. And that kind of thinking is really, uh, it's smart to think that way because revenue from older product can become stagnant, right? Uh, think of like Blockbuster Video. Yeah. Blockbuster Video, um, their revenue stream was like you go into a physical store. It was a fun store. Yeah. It was great. It was a lot of fun going there. You'd go into like a physical store. You'd go pick out a video on DVD or VHS whatever they had, they had all this stuff in there and you'd go in there and, you know, you drive home. They weren't eating their own revenue stream by putting it online. And I think companies like a Netflix, they've kind of, what I like about Netflix is they are trying to always reinvent themselves. When they said that they were going to create all this content, I'm like, what are they doing? This is, they're doing something so different and they're putting this big bet out there. They're kind of competing, but they're kind of figuring out ways to like, change their company as they go along. I think that's really noble. You look at the industry like Tower Records. There's a great documentary on Tower Re- Records. Um, you know, the music industry, streaming, they should have embraced it earlier on. Uh, I think it would have been to their benefit, but they were like, oh my God, no, that'll eat our revenue stream of selling CDs. Yeah. Let's fight that tooth and nail. I think they should have hired a bunch of engineers and started to build like Spotify before Spotify came along and built it, you know, and now they're all working with Spotify, which isn't a bad thing. I think it was going to happen regardless, but I think that, yeah. you know, that's a book that I, I really took away. The innovator's dilemma is you innovate, you get all this revenue and it's counterintuitive, but sometimes you have to like figure out what is next before someone else comes and, and, and takes a piece of that from you. Yeah. Makes makes good sense. Excellent. Well, Daniel, it's been a pleasure catching up with you and uh, checking out all the new Apple products. We'll see what uh, we'll see what comes next. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the new uh, Apple built uh, chips that are powering the new uh, MacBooks and uh, iMacs. That's what that's what I'm waiting for for next year. But I, I won't try to strap an iMac onto my wrist. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. This was great. 
You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.